Video games this year were an escape for me. A momentary reprieve from the extreme realities of the things happening to and around me. The things I needed to do, the places I had to be, the responsibilities only I could take care of. Making this video without acknowledging those things feels wrong, just as it would feel almost untruthful to omit all of the people that influenced my taste in games this year. The communities I was a part of that played these games alongside each other, the video game podcasts that accompanied me on long drives, and the people that listened to me talk about real life shit in between catching up on the games that we'd been playing recently. I said in my last video that I'm not much of an online multiplayer guy, but at this point, video games are much more of a social experience for me than they've ever been. It doesn't matter that most of what I play are extremely pretentious narrative-driven games. So when I think about my games of the year, yeah, I'm thinking about the games, but I'm also thinking about all those Discord chats about Tunic as new people discovered it throughout the year. I'm thinking about Gareth Damian Martin watching and loving my Citizen Sleeper video only like an hour after it was published. I assume because they saw it from one of you. And I'm thinking about you, the people who come back and watch these videos and leave comments and make all of this worth doing. So thank you to each one of you. These are my favorite games of 2022. We got two major Pokemon games this year. Both reinvented a dated formula, both looked questionable, and both were incredibly fun. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet have gotten the brunt of the hate online, and I'm not here to dunk on those games. They're great games buried under several layers of performance and graphical issues. But I'm old enough to remember January, when we were saying those same exact things about Pokemon Legends Arceus. Pokemon Legends Arceus hit hard for me. I spent so many hours in just the first zone just catching wild Pokemon. My favorite part about this game is how the battles are optional. Catching Pokemon without having to engage the Pokemon battle system, which I've always found very slow and opaque, was everything I didn't realize I'd wanted in these games. And yeah, the bosses were kind of a mess and the game didn't look as good as I thought it should have, but I was having a blast. This game made the Hisui region feel like a place Running around its zones, weaving through Pokemon as I went, I felt the things that I'd wanted to feel about Pokemon since I was a kid. They were all right there. You could almost reach out and touch them, or you could absolutely brain them with a Pokeball and take them with you. I'm trying my best lately to let my opinions be, to not have everything be a response to an opinion that I don't share, to not treat every individual person like they represent the toxic subreddit for the thing that I like. But that's hard with Pokemon, and it kind of always has been. So here's what I'll say about this game's issues, as well as those in Scarlet and Violet. We got two major Pokemon games this year. Game Freak has obviously been struggling to make one for a long time. If there are issues, if these games were rushed out the door, that likely means that individuals working at Game Freak experienced significant crunch. We didn't need two Pokemon games this year, and I hope management at Game Freak feels the same. Because I'd love more Pokemon Legends Arceus, and I'd love it to be better, but not at the expense of the people who actually make it. We can wait till these games are done. I hope this Legend series continues. Pokemon Legends Arceus stands out in front of Scarlet and Violet for me because it focuses on the things that I love about Pokemon and sidelines or improves the rest. It makes the Pokemon world feel real and makes the Pokedex the driver of progress, not battles. That said, it improves the battle system in ways that I enjoyed while also eliminating my fear of random encounters. Navigating, especially after you get Sneasel, feels really great, and the places you're exploring allow for a level of discovery that I hadn't expected. This is a game that I know I'll be coming back to. At times, the case of the Golden Idol reminded me of those kids' point-and-click games from the 90s that were supposed to teach me math. I swear that's a compliment. The vibes in both cases are immaculate. The Case of the Golden Idol is a game about uncovering mysteries. There's a grander narrative, but in each chapter you're finding clues in an ongoing scene and attempting to put together the story of what happened in that moment. It's a beautiful game. It's not as beautiful as like Norco was, but the art style is the similar kind of pixel art meets simple line drawings that I really dug. And the mysteries made me want to dig even past some of my frustrations in some of the later, more obtuse puzzles. I still wanted to just find out what the hell happened here. If you've played Return of the Obra Dinn, you know what kind of game Golden Idol is. That was a game that I had similar feelings about regarding difficulty, but a game that I adored all the same. I played this game in two settings, on my couch, on the Steam Deck. 
While the controls weren't perfect for it for that kind of game, it felt like a game that I should spend an evening with, or two. The intimacy and comfort of relaxing with a book is exactly the vibe to bring to this solid deduction narrative. I Was a Teenage Exocolonist is a game I only played at the recommendation of a person whose taste that I trust. It's a game with an aesthetic that, frankly, made me uninterested to begin with. Its storytelling and idealism in its early hours had me ideologically nodding, but wincing at how on the nose and didactic it seemed to be. And then something happened in the story. Something happened, and I realized that this was a game about growing up and about all of the ways that we adapt to a world that changes around us. It's about learning and growing beyond the wisdom of the people that raised us. And it's also about finding the parts of things that they believed that still ring true. I Was a Teenage Exocolonist puts you in control of a player character with any number of combinations of gender, body type, name, and pronouns. Whichever version of this character you choose, you're gonna start their story at 10 years of age, when the ship that they've lived on their entire life lands on a planet called Vertumna. They're a member of a small group of ideological refugees that left a ruined Earth behind, knowing the life ahead of them would be difficult, but not knowing how. And you play this character, getting to know the other kids in your colony, learning about the unique attributes of this strange new place, and deciding what kind of person you're gonna grow up to be. There's aspects of an RPG here. There's visual novel elements. Hell, there's even a relatively light but totally serviceable deck building game here. And you can turn that off if you're uninterested. But I think the more important thing is the stories these mechanics are telling. Each card in your deck is a crucial moment in your life. Early on, you might have a card that represents the first time you crawled. Later on in the game, a card might represent your first kiss or your first loss. People told me before I played Exocolonist that it was a game that benefited from multiple playthroughs. The game signposts this in its first scene, where your character has, presumably, a dream from a past life. And you see yourself die. I played through this game while on vacation, and while I powered through it because I was having such a great time, I wasn't sure how much a repeat playthrough was something I was going to be interested in. When I finally did start a new game a couple months later, I immediately realized how things could be different this time. The interesting thing here is that in subsequent playthroughs, the game subtly nudges you to make new decisions. It's actually providing new opportunities that you didn't have the first time round for things to go differently. There's critical plot moments from my first playthrough that I wanted to go differently the second time, and at least one of those has already turned out different. Teenage Exocolonist didn't knock me out the way some other games have. It didn't overwhelm me. Instead, it sat with me and let me learn about it, the way a child learns about the world, and it asked which parts of that world I wanted to focus on. The genius here, the magic, is how tightly my own experience with this game mapped to my character's experience of their new world. And to bring an entirely different vibe to this video, all of the adults in this game are hot. I mean, look at these people. Anyway, that's I Was a Teenage Exocolonist. About a month ago, I saw a headline from PC Gamer that got me more hyped for a game than I've been in a long time. Marvel's Midnight Suns is more Fire Emblem than XCOM. Now, I've got at least 120 hours in Fire Emblem Three Houses. I'm on my third run of that game, Golden Deer for Life. The mixture of storytelling, character exploration, and tactics in Three Houses sounded at first like something I wouldn't enjoy. It was honestly my first tactics game and I was pretty scared about all of the RPG elements. Managing a bunch of opaque character stats is my version of hell. But the thing about that game is that all of its parts are really good. Sure, for old school Fire Emblem fans, the tactics were a little vanilla, but for me, it was more than an incredible entry into the series. The characters, the world, the people I knew that loved it, and yes, the mechanics, made Fire Emblem Three Houses one of my favorite games, period. So when I heard Firaxis, known for, among other successes, the XCOM games, was making a narrative-driven Marvel game, my ears perked up. XCOM is a bit more hardcore tactics than I usually like, but I was interested from the first trailer. This game could have been a reskin of an XCOM game, and if you've heard any press about this game, you might know that Jake Solomon of Firaxis Games said that that's what Marvel wanted them to build when they approached them, and it's the first thing Firaxis actually did build. But that version of this game wasn't fun, so they went and reinvented a new style of tactics that fit a superhero story better. And y'all, they fucking nailed it. This game is so fun. I was showing it to a friend and he started screaming when Iron Man kicked a trash bin and knocked out two Hydra goons. I thought he was going to blast them from across the map, but that was so cool. That's how every move feels. 
And when you're not busy taking down Hydra, you're hanging out in this old house called the Abbey in a cross-dimensional Salem, Massachusetts with the Avengers and a small group of B-list heroes, the Midnight Suns. The versions of the characters in this game are mostly different from their MCU counterparts. This game is much more in conversation with the comic books, though it does stand apart from them, I think. These are not Fire Emblem Three Houses level characters. It'd be hard to do that well if you're writing them with everything these characters mean to the player already and all of the restrictions that come with being a part of the Marvel Universe and the Disney Corporation. But it's that B list that I find the most interesting. There's three characters here that I've really been drawn to. The Ghost Rider in Midnight Suns is Robbie Reyes. You might know this version of Ghost Rider if you watch the ABC show Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is, in my opinion, one of the best Marvel TV projects ever made. Robbie's goofy, but committed to his team and the mission. He's got a little brother that he's always talking to on the phone, and he confides his struggles with being the Ghost Rider in our player character, Hunter. If you watch the Hulu show Runaways, it's still on my list to watch, or if you read some of the incredible comic runs, you'll know Nico. She's a witch that does blood magic with a staff called the Staff of One. It lets her do really powerful magic, but she can only cast each spell once. Nico cares a lot about the mission the team is facing and thinks the Avengers are kind of railroading their approach to saving the world. She wants the rest of the Midnight Suns to be invited to the war table, to be included in investigations and research. Before one of the early story missions, the Avengers are trying all these wild, ultimately useless ways to find out where Venom is going to strike next, and they've left Nico and the others in the other room. That's when Nico and the Suns come to them, phones held out. Venom has attacked in New York, and people are streaming it live on TikTok or Instagram or whatever app these heroes use. Nico makes sure it's known that if they'd been included in discussions, this could have gone faster. By far, the standout character in this game is Magic. Magic is a member of the New Mutants, she's the sister of Colossus, and she's the ruler of the Realm Between Realms, a demonic place known as Limbo. Magic, to start, is an incredible unit. She can place these portals on the map and then knock people into them anywhere across the map. I bring her along on missions far more than I should for a balanced experience. But also, Magic is the best written character in this game. The story starts out with a prominent character, one of the Avengers, being captured by the game's primary antagonist, Lilith. At the beginning, Nico and Magic are the only ones that seem to care, and they want to go after this character. And Magic is the only one that keeps bringing it up. It sticks with her, because she knows what it's like to be abducted to an unknown place, to be held against your will. Her compassion comes from experience. She'd rather be out there trying to save her friend than playing portal taxi for the Midnight Suns. Magic, Nico, Robbie, and the tactics portions of Midnight Suns are why I've put up with how buggy this game is. They're why I spent several hours getting it to run smoothly on Steam Deck, a platform the developers very much want you to know it is not optimized for. 20 hours in, Marvel's Midnight Suns is not just a twist on a formula that worked for me. Individual pieces are stronger or weaker than comparable stories and games, but the whole package is something else entirely. I just wish Marvel would let the superheroes f Before I say anything, I want you to know that this game is available not only on Xbox Game Pass for PC and console, but also on your phone via Netflix. So if you want to play an incredibly innovative full motion video game, Go to your phone's app store and search for Immortality. Her Story, the first game by Sam Barlow, director and writer of Immortality, changed my idea of what a game could be. In that game, you play someone digging through old police interrogation videos, attempting to put together the story of a decades-old murder case. The game here is not something you win. You complete the game by coming to an understanding. If you haven't played Sam Barlow's Her Story or the follow-up Telling Lies, then Immortality is going to be a whole new kind of game for you. And if you have, you're going to be so impressed with how far this game goes to one-up its predecessors. Immortality is a game played by watching clips of three fictional movies and their behind-the-scenes footage. The three films, which were actually written, directed, and filmed just to be included in this game, all star the same actress, Marissa Marcel, played spectacularly by Man and Gage. In the in-game fiction, Marissa Marcel starred in two movies, Ambrosio and Minsky, in the 60s and 70s, which never released. And then she disappeared. Then, around the year 2000, she reappeared with her collaborator from the second film, and they shot a third movie, Two of Everything. That movie was also never released. Nonlinear storytelling by watching found footage in effectively random order is Sam Barlow's thing. 
and how he's done it so well now three times is baffling to me. There's more to it than what I'll say here, but you play this game by selecting clips of film and watching them to learn more about what happened to the production of these films. The game introduces this match cut mechanic where you can click on basically anything in the clips and it goes and finds another clip with either that exact item or a similar item or sometimes even something just shaped like that item. This is how you find more and more footage and put together more and more of the story. And I must say again that they legit made three whole movies for this game. And they're good. Not only that, their in fiction actors are played by real actors, but they are acting both in the in fiction movies and the fictional parts between scenes in those movies. The level of writing and directing and acting is immaculate. I would go see Minsky in theaters tomorrow. The production is incredible here. Because I don't want to spoil this game for you, I'm not going to get too deep into the themes of this game. It potentially has a lot to say about identity and gender and maybe even Hollywood's objectification of women. Jacob Geller has talked about this game twice recently, both in his Game of the Year video and in a video dedicated to a particular scene from this game. And he calls immortality adult, and that is a word that I agree with but not in the way that adult means sexual, definitely that, but also because this game just deals with really heavy stuff and it does so masterfully. Once you finish this game, you definitely should go watch both of those Jacob Geller videos. The one titled The Best Moment in a Game This Year blew my understanding of this game's themes wide open. So get downloading, it's gonna take a bit to finish. You should have plenty of time to finish this video while you wait. Vampire Survivors is the product of its developer playing a game they liked and thinking, man, I'd like to make something like that. Luca Galante played the Android game Magic Survival and really loved it. Then he bought an asset pack and got to work. In an interview with Patrick Klepek on Waypoint, he said he only launched the game on Steam because Itch didn't have effective community features. He just wanted to have a small group of people he was responsible to to make the game better. And then the thing that happens, happened. A big YouTuber made a video about Vampire Survivors, and within a month, I was introduced to a game that I still cannot put down. The game doesn't look like much, but when you're navigating massive hordes of enemies with a single stick and your attacks are firing off in all directions, the near misses and storms of pixels are exhilarating. This game makes me feel that one more run feeling nearly as much as Hades did. And until 1.0, this game was $3. At full launch, the price jumped to $5. This game is the best $3 purchase I've ever made. I'm so happy Luca took the time to make this silly little game, and I hope he uses the money to make more. I said to some friends the other day that much like Luca Galante and Magic Survival, Marvel Snap is a game that makes me want to make a game. There's a permission I find in the story of Vampire Survivors specifically, the inspiration it was derived from, the copycats it spawned, and the sub 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 genre that it didn't create, but demanded. Marvel Snap lights my brain up with a creative electricity. Yeah, it's doing that mobile game thing where it's doling out dopamine hits at the exact right intervals so that I'll spend money at ever decreasing intervals. But there is a simple, pure mechanical invention here. And without it, none of that manufactured capitalist nonsense would even phase me. The game is good. I would like it without all of that. I've already spoken about this game at length on this channel, but I want to reiterate that without Marvel and without mobile game monetization BS, Snap would still be one of my games of the year. I can't know how much I would have played it, probably less than I do now, but I'd definitely be less conflicted about putting it on my games of the year list. But as I was going through the games that stuck with me this year, I just couldn't leave it off. The thing that solidified its place in this list was the night I created a completely free-to-play account. A fresh account that I would not let go too high in matchmaking that I could play to avoid the rank grind. Playing on that account is just as fun as playing on the account where I got up to a season rank of 73 and have spent a solid amount of money. They made a good game, y'all. It's a shame about all the rest. It's rare for me to encounter a game that makes me feel the way Tunic did. In my video on the game, I talked about the senses of discovery and mystery and difficulty that this game uses to keep you engaged. And I said how it was that mystery that drew me in specifically. But I didn't say enough about the sense of wonder. There are visual and auditory moments in Tunic that I set in for several minutes while playing and that I revisited my memory regularly. 
The sounds of this game have given otherwise stale moments in my days that same wonder, thanks to the music by Life Formed and Janice Kwan. Tunic is a game that's nearly impossible to know all of. I don't mean that it's large or terribly long, it's really actually rather approachable in size. What I mean is that you can 100% Tunic and still not know all of the craft, all of the care, all of the thought that went into making this game what it was. I skipped one optional fight, but besides that, I did everything that Tunic has to offer. But I still learn more about the game what feels like every week. The community's translation of the in-game glyphs revealed so much to me. The Twitter thread by the game's sound designer unveiling and explaining a second secret hidden language hidden in the game's music and sound cues blew me away after that. There are moments in this game that I can never forget. Moments like crossing the bridge towards the quarry and climbing the tower to the librarian. The sense of power I felt after finishing a brutal boss rush fight late in the game. And the absolute elation of completing Tunic's final in-game puzzle. Tunic mechanically is another game that I shouldn't have loved, but I did because it was simply beautiful. About an hour and a half after my Citizen Sleeper video essay went up on this channel, Gareth Damian Martin and the official Citizen Sleeper Twitter account shared it to their followers. Gareth wrote that it was extensive, personal, and beautifully narrated, and that it really gets what's at the heart of Citizen Sleeper. At the time they wrote that tweet, I was recording an episode of Asynchronous, a wonderful video game podcast that I'd been invited onto that week. I'm not on Twitter much anymore, and I really only checked it because I wanted to know if the video had gotten picked up there at all. When I saw the Citizen Sleeper account and Gareth in my notifications, I freaked out and sent the link to AJ and Kim, who I had just finished talking about the game with. And then I sat at my desk, and I cried. And shit, I'm crying right now as I write this. Because everything I went through this year, I viewed through the lens of Citizen Sleeper. And through the hardest parts of it, I was writing that video or recording it or rewriting it or editing it or begging my brain to free me from the depression that brought my work on that video to a halt. I poured every extra ounce of myself I had into that video because that story meant so much to me and because I needed it. And after all that, the audience it was intended for not only found it, but loved it. And I don't just mean Gareth. You all have been so incredibly supportive and have helped me understand what's good about making the things that matter to me. I often get so self-conscious about being another person peddling their new little project. And to have my most raw, most personal work be validated like that meant more to me than any view count ever could. But hey, views would be nice too. So if you like my videos, you should tell a friend. Citizen Sleeper is obviously my game of the year. What else could it be?